Hello everyone, welcome back. And today I wanted to talk about something that I've been thinking a lot about recently as a graduate student in my clinical psychology graduate program, which is the idea of types and categories versus dimensional approaches and how we think about these things in relation to psychological constructs. Now, if you know my channel, you know that I'm a proponent of, for example, the Myers-Briggs type indicator. I like personality type. I think it's an okay metric and it's a useful tool when used within the constraints of what is meant to be used for, say, for example, self-understanding and interpersonal communication. Um, I'm also a fan of, for example, Jungian type and a few other things that are type focused. But also as a psychology graduate student, you know, we're seeing in the field this gradual movement away from type and category based approaches to dimensional approaches, meaning that we're trying to get a more nuanced view on these topics. Now, this is something that's been an internal conflict and debate for me over the past few years, because as someone who likes types, likes these categories in some sense, I think that the field as a whole is kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And that I think that by moving to dimensional approaches and kind of abandoning the type and category focused approaches that have been used in the past, we're getting rid of some sort of value. We're getting rid of something that is useful within how we view these constructs, how we view these things that we're attempting to understand. And this isn't just going to be something that you're going to see in personality. The reason I've been thinking a lot about this recently is because uh, within the past few weeks, I had to do a presentation on attachment styles. Now, if you're familiar with attachment styles or attachment theory, it's a general theory that proposes that there are four distinct attachment styles, or you can call them types even, that are going to um, describe how we interact with others based on our attachment, anxiety, or our security. Now, for a long time, you know, 40 plus years, we've been thinking about attachment in terms of categories and types. But in the recent 10 to 15 years, we're seeing this move away from the attachment styles towards attachment dimensions that are based on the two dimensions of anxiousness and avoidance. And what the research is essentially saying is that they think it's more accurate to talk about attachment style through the lens of these two dimensions as opposed to the four attachment styles or types. I think that this is true in some sense and also problematic in others. To really get at the heart of what I'm trying to talk about here, I want to get you to think about what you gain and lose in each of these approaches. What are you gaining by going from a category to a dimension? Well, you're essentially saying that, okay, we understand that there's these like clusters of traits or this, this cluster of the thing that we're attempting to measure. We're in this general score range and we're going to be able to have general descriptors for people who are in that general score range. A good example of this would be the MBTI where you have two sides of a dichotomy. You know, you're an introvert or you're an extrovert. You're kind of on one side of the coin and we're going to have primary descriptors for each person who's on that side of the coin. Now, what do you gain when you move to a dimensional approach from that? Will you gain a more specific idea of where someone lies within the category. So if you're using the MBTI, for example, if you score 55th percentile in introversion, extroversion towards extroversion, so let's say you're 5% more extroverted than introverted, you're going to score as an extrovert. And that really isn't going to tell you too much about the difference between how you score as someone with 55th percent extroversion versus someone who's like 90th percent extroversion, you still will get a dimensional score if you take the MBTI and you get that kind of result. But what I'm saying here is that for the average person who's just looking at their results, they're going to say, okay, they landed within that category. So they have the general descriptors associated with that side of the category. And therefore it can be even more dangerous when you're looking at people who score in those mid ranges who might accidentally score on the other side of that coin. So if you're someone who's within that like five to 10% mark, you might find that you'll accidentally score on the other side of the coin if you take the test on another day. But you kind of lose all those worries and concerns by moving to a dimensional approach where now you have an exact idea of where someone lies on this spectrum where they lie on this dimension, you can say, okay, so you're 77th percentile, you're 80th percentile, uh, and you can understand what that means for the individual who is there. What you're losing though, when you go from uh, categorical or type to dimensional is you're losing the broad descriptors and you're losing a way to easily communicate the differences between the score ranges on a dimension that you're working with. So say for example, 
Let's look at the MBTI step two, which is an evolution of the MBTI one. In the MBTI one, there's two categories. There's introvert, extrovert. In the MBTI step two, there's introvert, mid-range, extrovert. And what we're kind of gaining by adding this other category here is we're saying, okay, there is this middle range where we can see that someone might have characteristics that are presented by both sides of this coin. But when you go to the dimensional approach, you're losing the ability to communicate easily where you score on this range. So if you score 80th percentile, that's just your score. Like imagine going up to someone in conversation and saying, you know, my score in openness to experience is like 80th percentile or my score in extroversion is 98th percentile. You don't really say these things in conversation. They're not conversationally efficient. They're not useful ways to talk about yourself for the average person, which is really what I think that the categorical and type-based approach when you're working with psychological constructs is attempting to do. They're attempting to say, okay, well, from a research perspective and on the back end, we know the individual scores that people have on these tests and assessments that we're giving them. But on the front end, we need people who are taking these assessments to get some sort of value out of that and be able to differentiate their scores from other people who are taking the assessments. And I really think that's what the type approach attempts to do. That is the strength of a categorical model. We can trace this back to something like the DSM, which looks at psychopathologies. A lot of people who are in psychology now will talk badly about the DSM and say, well, it doesn't really make sense to have all of these personality disorders and diagnoses and things like that. But then they forget that there's an inherent value associated with having categories of diagnosis, with having these types of disorders or these clusters of types of disorders. We group things together because they are similar and then we can reference things that are different based on those types within the categories. So within just the DSM, it's important to have these categories, at least in some sense, for a variety of reasons. And I'm not saying the DSM is like the final end all be all of psychopathology or understanding mental illness. But what I'm saying is that it has value that is quickly thrown out because people today think that the dimensional approach is better. As an example, what's a strength of a categorical model in the DSM? Well, one is that you have a language to communicate between practitioners efficiently and quickly with. So instead of listing 15 different dimensions of very different struggle areas that someone might be having as a patient or client, you say, I have this diagnosis, you hand that off to either a medical practitioner or, or a psychologist who's trained in that uh, terminology as well. And then there's a common language that they can use to quickly interpret and discuss the ideas that they're communicating with one another. It's also extremely useful for things like medical diagnosis or insurance even where, you know, how are you going to use a dimensional based approach to give someone um, insurance to determine whether or not they are eligible for financial compensation because of their mental struggles? Are you going to have a specific cutoff point where you're going to say, okay, well, if they score above 80th percentile, let's say in the scores on this depression inventory, then they're going to be eligible for um, some sort of financial compensation. Well, that kind of defeats the purpose of having a dimensional approach, because if you create a cutoff point, you now have a category, you now have a a type of some sense. The people who fall above that cutoff point are of a type, which is they are eligible for financial compensation, or you could say depressed enough to be eligible for financial compensation, or they are below that point and they are not. So no matter whether or not you're going to have some sort of dimensional model, you're going to have some sort of dimension for recognizing psychological con constructs, I think it's extremely important to recognize that types do have a place, they do have value, but you need to recognize that both can be useful and even true at the same time. You can have types and categories and styles that are valuable and useful while working alongside the dimensions that are going to be useful and applicable as well. So both of these things can be true together. To kind of really drive home the point that I'm trying to make here, I really want to go back to what I was discussing earlier about the idea of like using dimensions and types and categories in terms of like communication and even like self-identification. So like when you walk up to someone in conversation and you're referencing whether or not you're introverted or extroverted, do, do you say, 
I score 34th percent in introversion or the extroversion scale, I score 90th percentile. No, you say I'm an introvert or I'm an extrovert, or you might even say I'm an ambivert. But the, the productive part of this is that you have a category, you have a language to communicate your personality with other people in a way that's going to be efficient and quick for them to understand because they have a word to get a general idea of the score range that you fall within in regard to your extroversion and introversion. And I think that this can also be true of other things that we are measuring with dimensions. A lot of people who will talk about this topic in terms of whether or not dimensions and categories are good or bad will say that, well, introvert, extrovert is kind of like the easy one. I think most people who agree with dimensional approaches would say that you can have introvert, extrovert. But I think in reality, it, it's just as valuable to have these terms and things when you are discussing other dimensions that aren't just introversion, and extroversion. I think having, you know, high openness versus low openness using something like intuition sensing makes sense. And I'm not saying that like the MBTI here is the end all be all descriptor and categorical model. I'm just using it because it's the one that I'm the most familiar with. But it goes back to the same thing with like attachment styles. You know, you can tell someone, no, I have high attachment anxiety, high attachment avoidance. Um, or you can just say, you know, I'm someone who has disorganized attachment style. And in reality, you're communicating the exact same thing, but one of them works better as a language to interpret what you're attempting to say, and even works better to some degree in some research settings, because you kind of are able to simplify the thing that you're attempting to measure into one overall category that can then be correlated with something else, maybe slightly easier. But again, what I'm really trying to advocate for here the final note that I'm trying to say here is that you can have both. You can have types, you can have categories, and you can have dimensions, and they can both be useful and true at the same time. And that I think that if you're someone who is a researcher or just a general practitioner or someone who enjoys some sort of type-based model, just be aware of the limitations of both sides. Be aware that as you are using a category, you are accepting a lower resolution understanding of the thing that you are attempting to understand. You are saying that I'm willing to accept generalizations about this topic for the sake of categorization. And understand that if you're using a dimensional model, you're willing to say, okay, I don't want things to be generalized. I want them to be specific, but in doing so, I'm losing a common language to discuss this dimension with other people with. And I really think that's what's important about this topic and why I I think it's important for people to be willing to accept that both can be true. Thanks for watching.